Grace, I'm an alcoholic. Whew. Get that out of the way. Now I can lie. Um, <clears throat> no. Um, I want to thank Phil and um, the committee for asking me to come and talk. Um, it's an honor and privilege to do anything for Alcoholics Anonymous. This program saved my life. Um, uh, I work in the field, so um, I was talking to one of my clients that um, really was kind of privileged. Okay, he's privileged. Um, uh, and um, he was talking about lineage while I was talking about how alcoholics become alcoholics. You know, so I started off with the cute story about, you know, the, the cucumber and the pickle, you know, and how, you know, the cucumber becomes a pickle and the pickle can't become a cucumber again. And, and then he was proceeding to tell me about lineage and his family and all that, you know, and, um, and I said, okay. I said, well, you, only you can say you're a drunk. I can't say you're a drunk, but um, you're looking like a pickle. You know, <laughs> he's on a six DUI, so you know. I was like, either you were drunk or the cops were drunk, and there were different cops, you know. So, I think, I think you're quacking like a duck, you know. Um, my sobriety date is March fourth, nineteen ninety seven. Man. That's amazing for me to even say, you know. That was for other people. We were talking, uh, a friend and I, uh, about uh, just coming to Alcoholics Anonymous and how God puts angels in my life. And she just happened to be one of the angels he put in my life. Um, I want to thank her for being my road dog this weekend, you know, and coming up with me, Crystal. Thank you. I love you. Um, you know, um, she was one of those people that was doing Alcoholics Anonymous. And back in the day where the nurses were all white, you know, and had the little caps and everything. I'm dating myself. Yes, I'm old. Um, and, uh, and she was, she had an institution meeting and she came and it was my first time inter being introduced to a, a institution or a treatment or any of that. And she came in and she brought a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And she came in and if you know anything about Crystal, you know, which some of you know her, you know, she's, she has this distinctive voice and, um, but we, she wasn't my BFF back then. So she came in and she was like, let me tell you about Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, Lord, Jesus is so great, you know, and I was like, get her out of here. <laughs> and I told her, I said, you know, through the years, I realized that, you know, people like myself that haven't yet surrendered to the idea that we are who we are or what we are, we can't stand happiness because it's a reminder of how miserable we are in our own skins, and that's what was happening for me. You know, fast forward eight years later, you know, um, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I, adopt, I adopted that mentality, you know. I was ready, I was done, you know. I was drug, you know, lip dragging drunk, drug into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, I come from a, a happy little alcoholic family, a big alcoholic family. It's funny too, because as we speak, my family's reunion is this weekend. And I don't get to be there with all the happy drunks, you know? It ain't a party until somebody gets, starts fighting or passes out, you know? That's my family. Um, my dad was a drunk. Um, he was also a military man, he was in the Air Force. Um, he was stationed at Ray Pat Wright Patterson Air Force Base, and um, and uh, my home was an alcoholic home. I grew up in a small little town called Loveland, Ohio. It's not far from here. It's about 30, 35 miles from Cincinnati. Um, I can tell you that our, our my hometown was like Twin City to Mayberry, you know, nothing ever happened in my hometown. And that's what we called it, Twin City to Mayberry. I'm really happy to say that, you know, now I can appreciate how I grew up because there's so much going on in the world and, 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 and lack thereof that um, 
I can appreciate all those things that my parents gave me. Um, I can just remember being afraid from as far back as I can remember. I was afraid, not, af not really knowing why, but just afraid, uncomfortable in my own skin. I took my first drink when I was 12 years old. I stole it. I was a liar, cheat, and a thief long before I picked up a drink, except for I thought I had to be. I thought the story that I would make up about me was far more interesting than who I was. I didn't accept me, so I figured you wouldn't accept me. I took that drink, and I can tell you that I didn't get drunk, but I fit. And I knew from that moment it was what I had been missing all along. Now, it was Windsor Canadian. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a whiskey girl. I love whiskey and anything that's brown like me. Um, <laughs> uh, and I took that drink, and I can tell you that I couldn't wait to... That's all I thought about was when I'm going to get to do it, how I was going to get to do it, what I'd wear when I did it. You know, I mean, it was the obsession started right away. You know, um, by the time I was 15 years old, me and my girlfriends, we got these fake IDs. Their fake IDs said that they were 20, 21. Mine said I was 25. And what that says about me is that I need more than you be, to be okay. I need yours. I need mine, you know. Um, we got these fake IDs, and we proceeded to pack what we used to call our hoe bags. And what a hoe bag consisted of was some high heels, something sexy to wear, couple joints, you know, um, a pint, a half a pint or a pint of some, of course, some brown liquor, Jack Daniels, Jim Beam, I loved all the guys, you know, um, and we put them in this hoe bag, and I'd lock my bedroom door from the inside, drop it out my second story bedroom window, hang drop where my girlfriend had the car running, it was a whole big to do, and off we'd go into the night to downtown Cincinnati. Now back then, downtown Cincinnati, there was one of those little hole in the wall bars on every corner it seemed like. And they had these colorful names like Larry's Pleasure Box or a satisfying place, KT's Den. Yeah. Um, you know, Jerry's Disco and only to name a few. Now, we had to travel 30 miles, so by the time we got to those bars, we had transformed into these grown women. Of course, because our hoe bags were magical, you know. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> when we got there, I'd belly up to that bar and I'd flash that ID, and it was like I stepped out onto the red carpet. I had arrived. And I know now that that whole act even before the alcohol, and I got into that bar and bellied up to it, was just as intoxicating and addictive as the alcohol itself. You know, it talks about me in the, in the big book that um, our drinking was only a symptom, you know, of a bigger problem, me. Um, so fast forward, um, uh, I would, end up going to places like, uh, you know, uh, places where they had, you know, things that were extra things, you know, other than alcohol. And um, I remember my uh, high school reunion, I mean, my high school graduation where my, uh, my dad would, he'd be waiting for me and my mom when we came in for my graduation and he'd be talking about, there she is, there's my graduate. And I remember how much I hated him at that moment because all I wanted him to do was show up for me. You know, and I knew that I didn't know how to be a parent, but I knew I didn't want to be the kind of parent that he was. You know, a year later, I'd be pregnant with my first child and I would stop drinking during that pregnancy. And I remember when they put that beautiful baby in my arms and I made her a promise that she was never going to be alone or afraid or feel unloved. And that lasted about 2.5 minutes. And her cuteness wore off and she was in my way. And, I, and every chance I got, I would drop her off with her grandmother and I'd go do my thing because the love I had for drugs and alcohol was more powerful than any love I had for any human being, even myself. I had to drink. 
Eight and a half years later, I'd be pregnant with my second child. Now, it was easy for me to abstain when I was pregnant with that first baby, and that second child came along, and um, uh, two months into that pregnancy, I would have some white wine to calm my nerves, and I'd be off and running. You know, and, um, and I drank, and I drugged through that pregnancy. And I delivered that baby at seven months pregnant, and he was three pounds and seven ounces. Now, some of you have met my son. He's six foot five. He wears a size 18 shoe. That's my three pound, seven month, pound baby. He's a, he's a wonderful dad. You know, I have two beautiful granddaughters, and, um, you know, um, he's, he's the love of my life, really. Um, <clears throat> but... Saying that, I know that God always had his hand on me. I know he always had his hand on me, even though I didn't believe, you know. As a kid, I was made to go to church, and, and my mom was a good old church lady, and um, we went to this old Baptist church, and um, she'd have us to go into a uh, prayer meeting on Tuesdays and Bible study on Wednesdays, and Thursday would be choir rehearsal, and then, of course, on Sunday, we would have to come to church. And all five of us kids would be lined up like little good soldiers, you know. By the way, we all ended up being alcoholics. Um, and I just remember one day when we were getting ready for church, and I looked over at my dad, and I said, I said, I don't want to go to church. I said, that's all we do is go to church. I said, I'd just rather go to hell. <laughs> all this work you know, and he started laughing and he said, you are my kid. <laughs> <clears throat> That'd be a story of my life. Um, so back to the, uh, back to the, the kids um, eight and a half years later to have that baby and, um, and I'd move in with my parents and um, allow them to take care of me and my kids and uh, so I could use all the money that I made to drink and drug. Drugs are a part of my story, but I can just tell you that I'm just a drunk that did drugs. Um, so I'd be uh, at one of those places one night, you know, doing my thing, and, and the police came, and I'd be arrested. And I'd end up at a place at, it, uh, it was uh, 900 Sycamore Street, and it was the Hamilton County Justice Center. I hope I never forget that address. Now, I was at their grand opening. And it was where everybody was going to be taken from the old workhouse in Cincinnati on Coleraine Avenue to the new building. I could smell the fresh paint. It was back in the day where they had a lighter on the string. They would allow you to smoke in the new building. And, you know, that was before they were, uh, they would have to experience thieves like myself, you know. Um, and I remember thinking, I'll never, this will never happen again. It was the people I was hanging out with. It was the neighborhood. It was the police messing with us. But that was the first of many trips I was going to make to that justice center. You know, the love I had for drugs and alcohol was more powerful than any love I had for any human being, and I had to drink. Um, one particular line, I'm drinking with my dad because there's, there was always plenty of alcohol in, in that house. And, um, and I was going to wait until my dad fell asleep, and I was going to borrow some money out of his wallet. Um, and he did, and I borrowed about $50 out of his wallet, and I went down the street to get a little something, something, you know, and, um, and I was just going to be gone 20 minutes, and I was going to come right back, you know, um, have you ever just wanted to be, you ever said that you're going to be gone 20 minutes, and I meant it, you know, and I was going to be right back, and that 20 minutes turned into four days, and after those four days, I sauntered up the street, and my dad was sitting on the porch waiting for me, and he proceeded to tell me how much he was ashamed of me as a daughter, and I finally get to tell him how much I hated him as a father, you know. And I remember turning on my heel and walking away from that house. I don't remember asking him how the kids were. Oh, I'm sorry I was gone so long. But I turned on my heel and I walked away from that house, and I was missing from my family for a year and a half in downtown Cincinnati. Now, um... In that year and a half, a lot of bad things happened, you know. Um, and I didn't call home on birthdays, holidays, bad days, good days. But what I can tell you was that every single day that I was out there, 
All I wanted was my mom. All I wanted was to go home. And I couldn't, and I didn't know why. Now, um, I, would get, uh, I would be homeless in that year and a half, you know, and um, I slept in alley, alleyways and abandoned buildings and in, in cars, maybe your car if you left it open, and I'd find a, try to find a friendly hallway where I could be alone with my bottle and not be hurt because that had happened to me too. Um, and then before you know it, I'm standing on street corners and I'm jumping in and out of strangers' cars for little or nothing. And no amount of money that I got for what I was doing could have possibly been enough for what I gave up. I was forever changed by those experiences. It would shape how I thought about myself for the next decade or so until I came to you. Um, one day I'm going down the street and I'm doing what I needed to do to get what I needed to get, to feel how I needed to feel. And I run into a friend of the family. And he asked me when's the last time I saw my dad and I said, I'm not on anything he has to say. And he reached in his glove box and he pulled out an obituary dated the week before with my father's face on it. And I would like to tell you at that moment I got to a phone booth and called home. That I got a ride home. That I asked for help. But it was always, I got to do this one thing, and I got to get this one thing, and I got to finish this one thing, and I got to ask this guy for this ride. You know, it was always that one more thing. Because that's my story. I didn't go home. It would be a while before I actually got back home. And it was funny how I ended up there. Um, so I was on my way to get what I needed to get, and, and so, of course, I couldn't call home. And I just needed to put that one more in me, and I was going to call home. Some time would pass by, and I remember I was at a card game, and I met this lady. Her name was Billy. And I was at the card game with this guy. I was waiting for him to finish playing cards so I could rob him, because that's what I do. I'm that girl. You know, um, and he introduced me to his friends, and one of his friends was a lady named Billy. And Billy turned out would be a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know today that was God giving me mercy instead of justice because I couldn't make it to you. He sent Billy to me. Billy planted the seed. She was one of those angels, just like Crystal before I met Crystal and um, to plant that seed, you know, um, about Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know, before you knew it, I wanted what Billy had. And before you knew it, I was gonna ask her to be my sponsor and she asked me to do some things. She asked me to get on my knees in the morning and ask God to keep me clean and sober and thank him at night. She asked me to go to a meeting every day of Alcoholics Anonymous, read something out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which she bought for me and worked the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, show up in the rooms and be of service. And I thought that was way too much. First of all, I didn't trust women, <laughs> but I know that was because I wasn't trustworthy. See, I thought you wanted what I had. What I had was, by the time I got to you, my whole bag wasn't even a whole bag. It was an old bag, you know? <laughs> It didn't have any of that pretty stuff it used to have in it. It might have had a roll of toilet paper in it, you know, if I was lucky, some hair gel, you know, or something that I stole out of your medicine cabinet because I was that girl too, you know. So anyways, <laughs> um, two months into that, doing half-assing what Billy asked me to do, you know, I didn't do it. And I spent the night at that guy's house and he let me stay in his house, even though I stole from him every chance I got. And I was off to go to a meeting. And I went left when I should have went right. And I ended up at the dope man's, you know? And um, me and my girlfriends, we stole some stuff from some people. And we were supposed to meet up and split the proceeds. Now, I was out there for six days, I want to tell you that. And in those six days, I experienced more insanity than I had in my entire 
in my entire life. On that fifth day, I was supposed to meet up with my girlfriend and we were gonna split those proceeds. And you know, back then, we don't know how to shoot, suit up and show up. You guys retaught me that stuff, you know? And I was late and when I got there, I had found out that she had been murdered. You know, so what better reason to go out and get a drink or a drug, you know, than feeling like guilty for your best friend being dead, kid, you know, killed. So um, that's what I did for the next, I don't know, 12, 13 hours. I would constantly go back and forth through the projects, you know, and um, to put one more in me. But see, what I didn't know about was that Billy had planted the seed of Alcoholics Anonymous and um, my solution was no longer my solution, you know. And the morning came. And I remember I used to hate the sound of the birds singing in the morning because I knew it wasn't gonna be long before I would lose the cloak of the night to do what I needed to do to get what I needed to get to feel how I needed to feel. There would be this panic would set in because I had to get enough to last me until the sun went down again. Because see, I didn't come out in the daytime because I hated how I looked, so I knew you hated how I looked. So I had to get enough to last me until the sun went down again. But I'm here in front of you and asking you, because I still haven't been able to answer that, how much is enough? How much is enough? I can't answer that. If you can, maybe you don't belong here. <laughs> but I don't know how much enough is, but that's what I have, that panic was set in because I knew the birds were singing and I was gonna run out of time. I had, I call it soul sickness. You know, that feeling, that hole that takes over my body that I can crawl into, you know? That horrible, awful panic that was set in when you're telling me, I can't have any more alcohol. I can't put one more in me. What do you mean I can't put one more in me? I have lost the ability to choose that. And the morning came and the sun came up and, um, and I'm walking through those projects. And if you know anything about Cincinnati, the projects, when I say the project, I meant Lincoln Courts and Law Homes. This was two projects and they were combined. Um, they were separated by uh, a street called Derek Turnbow. Now, those projects are downtown Cincinnati. And where I dwelled was Lynn and Liberty to Liberty and John Street and over to Clark Street. Those are two city blocks. And I wanna tell you, today, it's that big. But that was my world. That's where I dwelled in those two and a half years that I was hanging out down there and I was homeless. But that's how small my world had become, that I thought it was so big. Thank you for that. Thank you for teaching me that my world is broad and roomy and inclusive. <clears throat> I would get to Derek Turnbow Street and I start having that meltdown. And I remember Billy used to say to me, Grace, are you praying? And I said, yeah, who could tell? That was so lame for me to admit that I couldn't pray. But see, the only God I knew about was my mama's God. She was close with her God. She was a good person, you know? And I had abandoned the thought of any God helping me because I had done so much dirt. <clears throat> I had cars backed up from both sides of the street and I was standing in the middle of the street on the double yellow line having my meltdown, you know? When we do it, we do it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I couldn't schedule that nervous breakdown, you know? <clears throat> And I said the only prayer that, that I knew to say, and that was, God, please help me. And, and in that moment, I thought about Billy. See, I had forgot about her in those six days that I was out there. And I thought, I'll call her, she'll know what to do. I had 35 cents in my pocket. 
and I reached in there and I got that money and I got to a phone booth. Now, this was the glass booth, you guys. I'm dating myself, okay, I'm an OG. And I got to a phone booth and I called Billy. Thank God we didn't have cell phones back then. For one, I probably would have sold mine. You know, I sold everything, you know, even me. <clears throat> so we had to memorize numbers, you guys. I couldn't, if you held a gun to my head, I couldn't tell you some phone numbers of family members, you know? But we had to memorize numbers and I memorized Billy's number. I got to that phone booth and I called her and I told her what happened. And she told me about a place called Mary Haven. She shared with me that she had gotten sober in Columbus. And she had uh, talked about her friends in the Columbus Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And she said, are you still willing to go to any lengths to stay sober, Grace? And I said, yes. She came and picked me up and she took me to her home. She left me in her home long enough to go to a Kmart, Walmart, to get me some fresh clothing. Um, I had on a pair of black jeans and a black t-shirt. I remember taking those t-shirts, those jeans off and, and they stood over in the corner and waited on me. She ran me a bubble bath and, um, and I remember getting in a bubble bath and, 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 and trying to wash myself and, and, and I couldn't get clean because it was inside, you know? I don't know if, you knew, if you've ever felt that way. But it was the first time somebody left me alone in their home with their things and I didn't think about stealing anything. She came to pick me up and I didn't know she had made some calls and she took me to uh, Columbus. Off we went in the middle of the night to Columbus. We would stop on the way and I'd be reunited with my children and my mom because see now she was grieving for a husband and a daughter. And off we would go and we would end up at Columbus. <clears throat> and she would take me to a lady's house named Cindy, Cindy Barksdale. Now we just lost Cindy not too long ago. And I got the honor and privilege of bringing Cindy her last meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think I was sharing with Crystal on the way up here you know, and I, I can't say it without getting emotional. Where would I be if Cindy took that call and didn't say, bring her to my house? See, she didn't know me. She didn't know, she didn't know me from Adam, but she was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Where would I be if she didn't say, bring her to my house? And when we got to Cindy's house, she would be there with eight of her friends of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they had the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous open. And they 12-stepped me right from that big book. And they talked about how they drank and how they drug and how they stay sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Gives a whole new meaning to saying yes to Alcoholics Anonymous, doesn't it? It does for me. When Cindy passed away, she had 38 years of sobriety. And she's sponsored many girls since I met her, and I moved back to Cincinnati three years of sobriety. But she asked me to come and bring her a meeting. That speaks not about me but about you and what you have given me. Thank you. <clears throat> My life has never been the same. Um, I have a life that is a, beyond my wildest dreams. I'm a grandmother, I'm a Gigi. Let me correct that, I'm a Gigi. It sounds cooler. <laughs> and I can tell you that I've done a lot in my life and I've achieved a lot, but it's the highest station I'll ever hold. <sighs> my granddaughter, her name's Aubrey, and she, um, we call her Bree, and she was reading some horoscope thing, and I love to tell the story because it's so funny. Um, 
I'm going to save her a seat. Uh, she says, um, she goes, well, I'm Pisces, Gigi. She goes, and it says that it's one of the most unpopular signs. She goes, what? And then she was talking to my grandson, you know, uh, her cousin. And so she goes, he goes, well, I think you're popular. She goes, I am popular. She goes, she goes, where are you, Gigi? And I said, I'm Aquarius. And so she goes, that's a kind of unpopular one, too. She goes, they don't know us. And I said, you're right, Bree. they don't know us, you know. I get to do that. I have an 11-year-old grandson, and, um, and I get to the honor and privilege of, of raising him because his mom is his mo her mother's daughter. And I get to do for him what I couldn't do for his mom. I mean, who gets to do that? <clears throat> when I, got, when I um, had to go to a custody hearing where I could be declared his legal guardian and, and um, the judge's name was, I, I'm, the judge's name was Rosen. Now, when I would go to court, I would always end up with the same judge, and, her, and his name was Ju Frank Rosen. God bless his soul. And this, and I said, do you know Frank Rosen? And she said, that's my father. That was my father. And, <laughs> and I thought, see, that's how my God works, because he has to hit me over the head for me to believe. And she said, did you know him? And I said, Yes, he saved my life. And here you are saving my grandsons. That's how my God works. See, he's so big and broad and roomy and inclusive. <clears throat> I got the honor and privilege of spending eight years working for a judge in drug court. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and I remember asking her when she offered me the job, are you sure? And um, she said, I am sure. Um, see, I didn't know, but she had heard that I was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was pretty active in the program. And she wanted a counselor that could give the clients Alcoholics Anonymous not by book or preaching it to them, but by an example. Thank you for that. I have a husband that uh, he's, n and never, he's not going to be in any danger of ever being one of us. You know, he'll take a swig out of a cooler and he'll tell me I have to drive home. You know. <laughs> Or he'll be like, I'm like, aren't you going to finish your drink? And he'll be like, oh, no. He goes, I'm starting to feel funny. And I'm like, keep going. It'll get better. <laughs> I remember my daughter saying, why are you encouraging him to drink? I said, because somebody has to. We can't. <laughs> it's my honey. A um, couple of stories, and I'm going to shut up. One is, um, like I said, all five of us kids are alcoholics, you know. Um, I had a sister, uh, her name was Valerie, she was a nurse. I have a special place in my heart for nurses and people that help people, you know, or teachers and people of such that serve the public because we need so many people like that right now, you know. We just need people that give a shit about each other in the world. And um, people like us, because that's what we taught. We were raised up to do that here in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know? I think the world would be a better place if we had that mentality. That's just me. Um, anyway, she was a nurse, and um, she was one of those functional alcoholics. Um, she drank every day, um, but she didn't have to stand on a street corner or go to jail. Um, or shame her family. 
but she was a good little drunk. It was a Tuesday night. I was at 4 or 5 Oak Street. If you guys know what, anything about 4 or 5 Oak Street. Oh, yeah. Woo! Um, I was at the 7 o'clock meeting. Sometimes it's like yesterday. I remember this. And um, I was talking to her on the phone, and um, she said, I'm going to go down the street and get a beer. I said, okay, I'll talk to you later. I'm going to the meeting. And um, my, my sister didn't know Alcoholics Anonymous, but she loved you because she knew you gave her her baby sister back. And it would get to be about 1 o'clock in the morning. I get a call from my other sister, and she said there was an accident. I'd have to go out to Bethesda North Hospital. And, um, and I thought, well, I'll just go out there because she'll probably need a ride home. And I got there, and I was led back to a trauma unit where there was a state highway patrolman that stood out there. Now, our theory is that she was in a blackout because she was a blackout drinker. And um, her blood and alcohol level was four times the legal limit. And they were trying to get the bleeding under control because she had been drinking, you know. I'm so glad I wasn't missing and I got to hold my sister's hand when she took her last breath. She was in a blackout and she, she ended up on Tylersville Road, which is a highway, a very busy highway, and she stepped in front of a truck. I'm so glad I got to be there and I got to hold my sister's hand when she took her last breath. I got to clean my sister up so my mom could come back there and say goodbye to her child. Because I said, I cannot let my mother see her like this. See, you taught me to care about any, somebody other than me. You taught me, you taught this taker to be a giver. Even in my worst moments. That's not me. That's you guys. Thank you for that. She left behind four grown children and and 12 grandchildren, and, and on holidays, and, and, and when they need their mom, they call me, me. Of all five of the children, my mom had a life insurance policy on me because she said that when I die, she, not if I die, but when I die, they'll, afford, they'll be able to give me a proper funeral for my children. The only one that had a life insurance policy. And here I am taking care of somebody else's kids. <clears throat> um, when I was out there and I was homeless, I had a baby. And um, it was a little girl. And um, my parent, I was missing from my family so they didn't know about it and I didn't know what I was gonna do with this kid because I couldn't take care of myself. I ended up in UC Hospital. And they sent out the social worker to talk to me and she said that I could put the baby up for adoption. I got to spend an hour with that baby and, um, and I prayed with that baby. And I asked God to make sure that she knew love, to send her to a proper home, where that she wouldn't feel alone or afraid and always know love. Fast forward, I'm working for drug court, I'm in my office and, <laughs> and you know, I used to tease my kids that every time they took a poop, they had to put it on Facebook. <laughs> Stop telling all your business, you know? And so the job I had, they monitored my Facebook page, so I couldn't just accept all these friends' requests. Well, I got a friend's request from a young woman. She looked familiar, but I thought, maybe I met her at a meeting, you know? And so I deleted the friend's request. Fast forward two weeks later, my daughter calls me and she says, hey mom, I got this inbox from this girl. She said she was looking for her family and her name was Audrey Marie. I said, T, I'm gonna have to call you back. That was one of those things that you don't discuss with your kids, you know, they didn't know about that, you know. So I said, I'm gonna have to call you back. I got on Facebook and I sent her a friend's request and she accepted it immediately. Make a long story short, I'm sitting in my office and the phone rings and I pick up the phone and I said, hello. And the voice on the other end says, hi, mom. My name is Elizabeth. I'm your daughter. Now, like I said, my God, he has to hit me over the head with it to, for me to believe. 
Not, are you Miss Marshall? Not, well, I got your name from. But hi, Mom. Not, you piece of crap, that you left me behind. You gave me that. I would have missed all of that. Turns out, her mother found me for her as a birthday gift. <laughs> Where does this happen? I asked God to show her love. What better mother could I have picked for her? I got the honor and privilege of taking her mom to her first Al-Anon meeting because her sister was dying from alcoholism. And her mom, when we met, she said, thank you for giving her to me, and now I can share her with you. Thank you for that. Today, God, I'm a crybaby. Today, um, I have a life beyond my wildest dreams. Um, I get to, I still work in the field, but I get to take meetings to people like us in nursing homes that would normally not get that service because it wasn't available to them. How genius is that? And I have just one particular client who's so near and dear to my heart, but he used to rob banks. He robbed the Federal Reserve Bank. And he's perfect for me. It's my client, you know? And he finally admitted to me that he couldn't, he couldn't uh, read or write, you know? He said, I can count. <laughs> if you met this guy, I mean, he looks like he's, he's a scary guy, you know, but he's just as meek as a lamb. And so I was trying to think of a curriculum I could give to him, you know, like, a, you know, the disease concept uh, about alcoholism, how alcoholism works. And, you know, and um, he said, um, can you read to me? So our hour sessions are spent me reading something from Alcoholics Anonymous, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and us having a discussion about it. And I'm just like, where's this have been? You know, and he's turned out to be one of my best clients. I don't, I don't work to live, I live to work, you know? I mean, I, I don't live to work, I work to live. Um, so I say this because the sponsor I have now, um, we had this discussion about how if I was going to go into this field that um, I couldn't use it as my program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I've kept that promise, you know. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my, my sponsor. She sent me a text and said, go knock them dead, you know. Tell all my friends I said hi. Um, and um, she couldn't come with me this time. But um, I met her long before I came to you because she would bring a meeting to the jails. And I would show up at that meeting just to get out of my, my cell, of course, you know. And um, she was always so nice, you know, um, and she would give me her phone number. I would ask for it every time. And every time I would end up in jail, I would ask her for her phone number. And not once did she say, oh, you're not going to call me. You always ask for my phone number. She was showing me how to work with others. And every time I would ask her, it was like the first time I had asked her for that phone number. You know, I have an institution meeting now. But she was teaching me how to work with others. And she's been my sponsor since I was five years sober. Um, and she's a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous because she shows me by her walk how to work a program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I have the honor and privilege of working with a 
the most phenomenal group of women. And they remind me every day how crazy I am, how absolutely psychotic I am, you know. Um, that dad that I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to always in my talks with that. Um, my amends to my father was I wrote him a letter and, um, and released it at the cemetery. And every so often I'll go and visit his grave. And um, one particular time me and my daughter were at the cemetery and I was, um, we were going to sit and, you know, visit at his grave site. Uh, the cemetery where he is buried is three miles from, I mean, three blocks from the house where that big argument took place between me and him. And that particular day, they were mowing the lawn so we couldn't stay. So we decided to go get something to eat and come back. Well, we ended up at that old house. And, I, and for some reason, I just was curious. So I parked the car and I walked up to the, the door and I knocked on the door. And there was a young man that answered and he invited us in. And I got to go through that house and share only happy memories about my childhood with my daughter. Now, it got to be about time for us to go back to the cemetery, and there was this, that middle room where a lot of drinking used to take place. And it was, it was the same, but there was different decor and um, different pictures on the wall, and there were little pictures on the wall, and they said things like, let go and let God. One day at a time, keep coming back. And right about then, the young man comes back in the room, and I asked him, I said, what is this place? And he said it was a sober house for men. And from that day to this, the screaming has stopped for me. I am so very proud to meet my father's daughter. If you've lived like I lived, if you drank like I drank, if you felt like I felt, please keep coming back. Thank you for my life.